Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Friday night interview for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Now, if it's your first time joining our program, uh, I'd like to welcome you, and I, I hope that uh, tonight uh, you'll have fellowship with us and you will uh, be blessed. And if you are, may, perhaps you want to join us on all of our programs. Uh, we have a Wednesday night Bible study uh, that starts at uh, 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time with Sister Renee Rowland and Brother Jason Kreps. Uh, we have the Church of the Eternally Secure Church uh, program every Sunday that starts at 5 p.m. Eastern time and I hope you'll join us there we have uh, talk and doctrine that's uh, brother Matthias brother Daniel sister Renee and myself and uh, so please join us in in the, in the congregation and for the people uh, who are with us all the time the regular members of the congregation welcome back um, now if you've seen these programs on Friday nights uh, I have I think 16 interviews uh, that I've conducted now. And if, if you're a regular participant in the congregation, then I ask that you volunteer so I can interview you. And uh, I hope you go back and watch all of those interviews. But we didn't have anybody available to be interviewed tonight. And uh, Brother Mark and I think I think uh, Bob also, B.O.B. Uh, -B Bob. <laughs> They've asked, uh, well, why don't we flip it around and interview Luke, you, Luke? And so I guess I need to consent to that since I'm asking everybody else to volunteer. So I'm going to be interviewed tonight by uh, Brother Mark. Uh, his, he is known on YouTube as uh, Kay Stover. So uh, uh, I'm going to just uh, flip the script now. And I turn it over to Brother Mark to conduct the interview, the, the interrogation of me. Hello, I'm Mark, also known as Kay Stover or Jabberwocky. Um, it's my turn to put Luke in the hot seat. Um, so we're roasting him. So anybody who has questions for him, you can just put him in the chat. We'd appreciate it. Um, is audio okay for everybody? Yeah. If you have any problems, let us know. Yeah, please. Uh, uh, on Wednesday nights, uh, someone said that my audio was off a little bit. It was a little too low volume. So if there's that problem, let me know and I'll try to correct it. But hopefully it sounds good. Okay, go, brother, go ahead. I, um, I have this theory that people's first memories either tend to be something negative or something very positive, And we forget all the mundane. So Brother Luke. Could you tell us your first memory, please? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. That's, uh, of course, you know, that's one of my favorite questions to ask everybody. But uh, I, I guess I'll say there are two events that I remember. And one is, I'm not even sure I might be imagining it. But I think I remember being a baby in the in a crib and, um, and um, um, my mother nursing me. But uh, I'm not I'm not so positive about that. It's been such a long time that I might be. I actually had a memory. I'll tell you about that next. But I had a memory that I actually imagined that I thought was real for many years. <clears throat> but uh, uh, the actual earliest memory that I'm certain of is in kindergarten. Uh, and it, it was a very wonderful, wonderful time. Uh, one of the happiest times of my life was kindergarten. Uh, it seemed like uh, we played with clay and we made little shadow figures and, and uh, we we took naps on a towel. And I actually, in kindergarten, found a girl in the class that I thought was really cute mm -hmm. named Susie. And I actually bent her over like in the movies. I somehow I must have seen it in the movies. I bent her over at the water fountain and kissed her. And <laughs> just like the movie stars do. Leia. Yeah, and, and that's my earliest recollection of uh, anything, and it was a wonderful memory. Uh, I'll tell you later if we get into it about the, the memory that I actually imagined and believed was true for, for many years. Okay. Um, yeah, so Luke's first memory is a kiss, everybody, and not just a regular kiss. It was a kiss with her bent over. He did the romance. 
<laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Luke. Um, so kindergarten was your happy time. Did you have both parents? Y yes. My, uh, I, 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 in hindsight, I look back and I'm so thankful. Right here on my desk, I keep a picture of my parents. Here it is, by the way. It's not a coincidence. I always have their picture on my desk here. Uh, thank you for sharing that. I don't know if uh, I don't know if you're getting the reflection or not, but that, those are my parents. His, my father's name was Lester Boozer, and my mother's name was Mary Nell Mary Nell Boozer. And uh, so I always have their picture here on my desk, and I asked my wife to uh, make me a photo album of all of my family and you know for the, all the photos of my life. You know, from the time I was a little boy with my friends and my family members, and particularly the family members who uh, are deceased, because I found that um, without that, without that constant reminder, their their faces fade away. I was beginning to actually forget what my own mother looked like, and it was it was a horrible. It made me sick to think that I can't remember my mother's face. So I we got I wanted to get their pictures out so I can keep their face in my mind. And I asked the Lord all the time if it, 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 I know that I can't communicate directly to them, but if it's possible, if please, uh, you know, speak to them for me and tell them I remember them and love them and appreciate them. Yeah, so I did have both my parents. They had uh, like, I don't know, 50 years more years of marriage so they were with me through my whole life uh, until i was grown and they eventually my mother died in december of 86 and my brother my father died about five or six years after that okay um complete side note do you think since they're or were they saved do you know um I, I don't know about my mother. I'm uh, I'm worried a little bit that about my mother. I'm doubtful about my father. Mm -hmm. because he and I, after I was born again, of course, I had to tell my family and friends about it, my faith and and their need for Jesus. And my father was very, very uh, involved with New Age. Uh, mm -hmm. He, he he got involved in hypnotic regressions. He believed that he was regressed hypnotically into previous lifetimes. He believed in reincarnation and all that stuff. And I was taught that. My family was we were all kind of taught all that as we growing up because of my father's beliefs. Uh, and he, uh, I of course tried to witness to him. And as he died, uh, as he was dying. I was witnessing to him, but he couldn't speak because uh, he was his condition was uh, with tubes in him or something. He couldn't speak, so uh, I'm hoping that he did uh, get saved before he died. But I, I really don't know. Okay, thank you for sharing that, Luke. I appreciate that. Um, hopefully, yes, you believe the gospel of grace. Okay, so we've covered kindergarten, and you had both parents growing up. Do you think that it played a, a role in the um, where you are today, having both parents? Yeah, uh, in, in my parents' generation, uh, you know, when people are talking about all these different generations now, my, my generation is the baby boomers, and we got Generation X, and all these, I don't remember all the names of all the generations now, but my father's generation is often called the greatest generation, the generation of, you know, World War II period and the depression that they went through all of that. And uh, uh, at that time, divorces were rare. And my parents, you know, they bickered a lot. Um, I, I don't really think that they had a wonderful, perfect, you know, ideal marriage, but I know they loved each other, but they did stay together because it was, it was uh, really when people made a commitment to, to get married in those days, it was a commitment for life. Divorces were so rare. So thankfully, they did stay together. And I did have the, the benefit of a two-parent family uh, for my whole life until they were passed away. Yeah, and it okay. was important to me to have that. Um, since we're in the topic of ages and stuff, can you share with us your age, please? 
I'm uh, 68, uh, and I'm, uh, let me see, um, uh, 30, uh, 26th, December. Let me see, my second birth was December of 86. So that gets us to 86, uh, 16, 30. So 32, 32 years old uh, with my new birth. So I'm 68 and I'm 32. Okay, so you're 68 carnally and 32 spiritually. Amen. Very good. Um, with the generations in the marriage, is it true that back then, um, if you were divorced, you were considered a fallen woman? Is that a term they used? If you're divorced, uh, mm -hmm. you know. You know. When, in my parents' generation, I, they, I imagine that that's the way they viewed it. In okay. my generation, that wasn't the case at all because my generation totally flipped everything around. The baby boomers were the generation of sex, drugs, rock and roll, being liberated from all the old rules. So no, divorce. And uh, in fact, I am divorced one time uh, from my, ah. my first wife. But uh, uh, divorce was just very common. Matter of fact, in my generation, we basically embraced the attitude that uh, hey, you get married and, you know, if, if you're not completely happy, just get divorced or leave them. And, uh, you know, it's the, there was really no commitment uh, for the most part in, uh, in my generation. Okay, so you went through the sexual revolution along with many other things, too, I'm sure. And we'll get into that. Um, as let's see we've gone through your kindergarten how was the rest of your elementary experience mm. well i uh, my time in school was fun i was more interested in having fun than i was in studying uh, i managed somehow to get above average grades i was not a straight a student uh, but i wasn't a bad student I was I was smart enough to get by and get good grades without working too hard, but uh, I did not like studying. I, I still don't like studying something that's forced on me. That, I, that if it's a subject I don't really have an interest in, I don't want to study it. But no. I do if if I have an interest in a subject, and there are numerous subjects that I've developed a great interest in my life, and I've become. My wife says I obsess. No, I just get really focused when I get interested in the subject. And, uh, uh, but uh, through all my uh, education, through junior high, high school and college, I did the what was required to get by, uh, but I was more interested in having fun. And I, I succeeded. I, I was pretty popular in, in school and had, had good friendships and, uh, you know, played sports and had a good time. That's the base thing I can say about school is we, we had a lot of fun. Good. Um, what college did you attend? Uh, University of Nevada at Las Vegas. When I started attending it in 1969 or 70, uh, uh, it was uh, known as Nevada Southern University. And, and then we got a basketball coach here named Jerry Tarkanian. And uh, he took our basketball team to a different level. So they decided to change the name of the school to model it after UCLA. Uh, University of California at Los Angeles is UCLA. So they took our university and said, we're the University of Nevada at Las Vegas, UNLV. So that's how that name developed. And that's what it's known uh, even today, UNLV. Okay, thank you. Um, were you born and raised in Las Vegas? Yeah, yeah, it's a very interesting story about that because, you know, <laughs> Las Vegas is, is it's not really a great place to uh, to live for some people because there's a lot of temptations here. And my father, uh, you know, he didn't really drink or gamble. He didn't really have any vices, but my mother got involved in gambling. Mm. And my, my father worked hard and he earned a good living, but but it, all the extra money, my, my mother would go off and gamble it. And she played slot machines and Keno were the games she played. And I, I think if I have any bad memories as a child, it's not. My, my mother would um, go to a casino and uh, take my little sister and myself. And we couldn't go inside because we're too young. You have 15 minutes to eat and clean up. 
Mm -hmm. I, I apologize. That's the Alexa dot telling the kids that they have bedtime snack. You may hear a couple more telling them bedtime. It's a reminder. Oh, that's interesting. That's uh, the technology does so much for us now. Oh yes, very much so. Uh, here's a here's a memory that uh, that I'll tell you that was not good from my youth, and that was that because my mother gambled way too much. Um, she would go to the casino to gamble and she would, of course, my, my other siblings were grown, but my little sister and I, uh, my mother would take us and we're not allowed in the casino because we're too young. So we would have to wait outside of the casino on the sidewalk. And my mother would be inside gambling for hours and it seemed endless. And we'd have to stand out there and wait on the sidewalk while she was gambling. Uh, my mother was just absolutely a wonderful mother in many respects, loving, encouraging. Positive. She thought we were all, the kids were the greatest. We could do no wrong. We were the most talented and the most beautiful, according to my mother. But her failure was, was this gambling and, and neglect in that way. And uh, so I, built, I developed a great resentment against gambling because I saw what it was, how it was capable of you know, harming people. Um, but here's the story about, um, my mother was gambling even before I was born and, uh, she would not leave this casino to go give birth. So I had to be born, uh, in the El Cortez casino. It's one of the old rundown casinos here. It's at the old Las Vegas downtown. I was born in the El Cortez casino on top of a crap table. And the headlines of the newspaper read that day, it said, Mother craps out at El Cortez. Huh. Yeah. Wow. And quite the story, Luke. You're full of great wisdom um, and interesting tales. No, okay. I have to. I have to now just say, forgive me, Lord. It's, it's just a joke. It's not a lie. It was just a joke, okay? Now, I was really born in a hospital. That's a. That's a story I just like to tell for fun. But, oh, uh, man. You ruined the box scars. Wouldn't have that been great, though, if I was oh, that in a wonderful. casino on top of a crap table? No, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, well. Now we see where the crap comes from. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Um, did she really leave you outside yeah. while she gambled? Yeah, no, that's, that part of the story is that's true. true. Uh, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, so in that part, time yeah. period... It What's was that? safe for you to be during that time period. It was safe for you to be on the streets of Las Vegas like that. Yeah. Uh, when I was a child, uh, I was allowed to just leave my home and be gone all day and go do whatever I wanted to do and come home. But by, by, by the time it's dark, get home. And they didn't, my parents didn't care, except if my dad needed me to help him do some kind of work around the house, then he'd come looking for me. But other than that, I was not monitored. We were just free and there was no worry about uh, uh, childhood, child abduct abductions. That kind of thing didn't happen. You know, if it did, it was so rare, nobody heard about it. Nobody worried about it. Uh, so I had a lot of freedom as a child and uh, that freedom, uh, you know, that's good in some respects, but uh, I, I, I did a lot of things. If my parents, they they were absolutely ignorant of everything that I've done. If if they knew all the things that I did in those in those times when I was off as a kid and grown up, uh, that uh, they'd be shocked. Right. Um, Las Vegas with it is today, isn't it um, pretty much everything's recorded? Oh, yeah, they've got cameras everywhere now. You can't go anywhere in, in uh, particularly the, the tourist areas. We have the old Las Vegas, which is called Fremont Street or downtown. That's where the original casinos were, and they, they still exist, but they're, not, they, they're tiny and, and meager in comparison to the ones on the Strip. But those casinos have been there since the, uh, the 40s. Uh, and uh, and then these big giant casinos on the strip, uh, those areas, there's cameras everywhere and there's tremendous security. I mean, you have police everywhere too, but they also, every security, every casino and hotel has a great security uh, staff and system in place. 
So it's really quite quite safe because of all the security and and, and police uh, policing and the uh, the cameras. Okay. Um. What age did you get married for the first time? Uh, my my first uh, wife was. Uh, 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 she was 18 and I was 20 and, and I was in college and uh, uh, the weird thing is that uh, <laughs> the law, the law at that time would allow a, a woman at the age of 18 to get married without parental consent. But if you're a man, you cannot get married without parental consent until you're 21. <laughs> that's that's so odd. Yeah, I, I, it's very yeah. strange. I don't know if they've changed it or not, but this was back about 1971, uh, 70, 71. And uh, <clears throat> so I was uh, very much in love with a, a girl that I was with. I met her in high school and uh, we became a, a couple in college, and we uh, we hadn't even talked about marriage, but we hadn't even thought that far ahead. We were just enjoying our love and our passion. And then I brought her home, and her mother was waiting for her with a shoe. And she was sitting on her porch on a chair, and she had a shoe. And my girlfriend, to be, who had become my wife, she was so afraid to go home because she knew she was going to get beaten with the shoe. So I, instead of dropping her off, I just kept driving. And I and once her mother saw us come and not, I did drop her off. It's even worse. So now I'm thinking, oh no, it's even worse. She went. To, what's she going to do now? So at that moment, <laughs> in my youthful stupidity, uh, not knowing the right way to deal with problems like that, uh, I said, let's get married. And so we we went down to the courthouse to get married. But they said I couldn't get married without my parents' consent. And that, shockingly, I explained it to my dad on the phone, and he came down and he gave consent. I'm I'm amazed he did it, but he did give consent. And uh, when we explained the the situation with her mother, and we got married on in the courthouse, and then we got married six weeks later, where all the family and and friends, and we had a real more proper uh, uh, wedding ceremony. Uh, so, you know, there's a song by Nancy S Sinatra. I got married in a fever, <laughs> hotter <laughs> than a pepper sprout. That's kind of how it happened the first time. Right. Um, so how did that change her mom in the shoes reaction when you finally did bring her home but married? Well, uh, my wife and once i married her my wife her name was bertha bertha she, she is cuban uh so her, the proper pronunciation of her name is bertha yeah. so bertha um uh, uh never went home uh she, you know, we were married so she didn't have to go home but of course after her mother understood that she's married she's out of her mother's control now then her mother accepted it and accepted me and we had a pretty good relationship with her uh, since, uh, since that time. But uh, it was uh, the, 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 the motivation to get married at that time was not thought out, planned, or it was really crazy. Yeah, I'd say that's a little crazy, Luke. You lived quite the wild life there, bub. Um, that was definitely youthful impulse. Okay, so we've gotten to the first marriage. You've gotten through college. Did you graduate college? Yes, it took me five years, but I got my degree, and my degree was in physical education. And uh, it was my intention to be a teacher and a coach. But when I finished college, uh, I was I was selected at my graduation as the most outstanding of the graduating class by the the, the faculty. Nice. Uh, so I did well in terms of that particular niche of study, teaching and education. Uh, I didn't have a, a talent for it, and they recognized it. So, But even with that accolade, uh, there were no openings. Uh, so I accepted a job after college to move to Florida and become a representative for a country where I became a motivational speaker. 
and I traveled all over southern Florida, which is on health and physical fitness and and uh, motivational talks to all, uh, hundreds and hundreds for about a year and a half. I had that job uh, with with my wife Berta uh, with me. Well, it seems like you're getting married matched right into your uh, first memory there. Impulse women. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Um, that impulse to kiss the girl in kindergarten, that impulse to marry Berta, uh, that has got me in a lot of trouble in my earlier years over that uh, sex drive, that interest in the opposite sex. My, I remember my dad... <laughs> When I was about 12 years old, my dad felt he had this responsibility to have a talk with me. And he didn't discuss anatomy and physiology, anything like that. Uh, he, he gave me a talk about sex. But, I mean, I knew, I knew the basics just from the neighborhood. The kids talk and learn about it. But, but my dad, what he explained to me is a lesson I didn't learn. He says, listen. You're going to develop these powerful feelings, and 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 if if you let it take control of you, it can ruin your life. You need to master it. You need to get control over it. And unfortunately, I didn't. It controlled me. Uh, I became obsessed with it for much of my life, and and uh, that's why I I feel for the young, the young saints, that uh, that have these feelings, and they. Uh, They've, they're so conflicted. Right. Um, Your dad seems like a very wise man. My dad was wise and very intelligent. And uh, he was, uh, he had a lot of great, great qualities. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't learn that lesson, unfortunately. I don't think many of us do. <laughs> okay. So let's see. We've gotten up through graduating college. You said you moved to Florida for a little bit. Um, is that the only time you've lived somewhere other than Las Vegas? Um, well, after my uh, job in Florida, uh, well, actually, uh, my wife and I started having problems, and then she came back to Las Vegas and left me, but it was supposed to be temporary. Uh, but, um, again, I'm impulsive, so... I ended up after a short time, maybe a few weeks or a month that she's gone, not being patient for her to return, or worrying that she might not return. I ended up quitting my job in Florida, moving back to Vegas without any plans or any any uh, any uh, promises of employment or anything. It was another impulsive thing without thinking. And so, but I moved back to Las Vegas, and but it turns out she wasn't ready to get back together. And I ended up, again, not being patient to uh, to try to give her time. Ended up, I divorced her, mm. because I, I I didn't have the patience to try to wait for things for her to maybe change her attitude. Uh, I wanted, I needed to move on because, again, that sex drive had to be satisfied, and so I was going to go f find some other women if if she if she wasn't going to be involved as my wife. I had to find some other outlet, and so I, I got divorced. Right, and I imagine in Vegas that's got to amplify everything just a little bit as far as women go. Yeah, yeah. Well, as I said, uh, that my generation, uh, I think today, I don't know. You know, they have this saying now about uh, friends with benefits, and 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 I think some people have the attitude today where. The, the, the sex is very, very casual, but I don't, I don't uh, think that's the, the norm today. I think this, the current youth, uh, they, they're a little bit more conservative sexually than my generation was. We were, it was a, it was a revolution because the generations before were so suppressed sexually that when we broke free from it, we went overboard. We went crazy. And just the 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 the, uh, the number of of, of part, sexual partners and the, the all I, I don't want to go into all the graphic details, but we uh, we were just so uh, sexually active that it was uh, out of control. And uh, um, I forgot your question. What your what made me go into that? 
<laughs> that it was a little bit more difficult and heated being in Vegas with women all around. Oh, to, yeah. No, yeah, it was. I don't know. Vegas it. Is, uh, is, it was because of Las Vegas, or it, as I think it was just the times. The times mm -hmm. were so liberated, sex was so available, and drugs, of course, drugs and alcohol freed up people and mentally. Uh, the, their inhibitions were removed, and and there was no uh, rigid code like uh, you know uh, uh, the law, right? <laughs> Christianity or the you know, the laws of Moses or any anything that said do's and don'ts. No, that was all ignored at, in, at that time. So uh, because of that is why everybody was and not just me, but everybody I knew. Well, that's the way the times were. It was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And, and right. uh, that's, that was uh, our, our focus of, of uh, life. You had a couple things working there, too, didn't you? You had um, Aleister Crowley at about that time, and Playboy and Hustler and all that stuff was coming out, and Elvis, and there was just um, the norms were being broken down from all directions, right? Yeah. Uh, when Elvis came on the Ed Sullivan show, and he did his shaking of his pelvis. They called him Elvis the pelvis because he shook his pelvis. <laughs> and it was it was outrageous. Elvis. The whole country was sh in shock. Elvis was shaking himself and doing this rock and roll and uh, freaking everybody else. Uh, and then, of course, the Beatles. And by the way, I'm one of the few people I think you'll ever find that actually got to see Elvis perform live and also the Beatles. The Beatles perform live. I've attended both of those uh, concerts along with many others, but those are the most uh, uh, significant historically as Elvis and the Beatles. And uh, so, but I did see a lot of uh, people like that and, and, and would go to rock concerts and stuff. And, and uh, you know, like Woodstock, I went to a concert that was in the West Coast in Portland, Oregon, that was called the, the Woodstock of the West. And that was, you know, if you've ever seen the movie and stories about Woodstock, that's the kind of environment we had in Oregon. Right. Um, let's see, you had the drugs and the sex and the rock and roll all coming in at, the, at that same time. Um, what's it like to be in Vegas during the holidays? Uh, well, when you were younger, it, it, it's. Uh, in the holiday, when I was younger, um, every night was a holiday, especially every Friday night. And uh, when I was in high school, we'd go down to Fremont Street, where the old casinos were, and we'd cruise Fremont Street and do crazy things. Uh, and, and so um, that's what, you know, you start. I started drinking in high school with, with my friends. I had uh, three friends. There were four of us were... The guys that we, they were the guys I hung up with all the time. They could drink a lot. They, they had the ability to drink a lot. It was amazing. Me, because, uh, because I'm a man and I have to keep up, and I don't want to be, uh, you know, uh, humiliated, uh, especially my, my last name is Boozer. So being named Boozer, you're supposed to be able to drink. Right. But I, I really couldn't tolerate the booze the way they could, but I tried. So that's what we did in high school. And then the drugs became popular and one drug led to another and another and another. And pretty much every drug that was available throughout history, except for shooting up heroin, every one of those drugs that have worked our way through our, our, uh, our groups. And, and we had all those. Lewds. What's that? Luke loved the lewds. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, that was not one of my favorites. No, but I, I'm I'm familiar with it. Yeah, but I'm, I'm right. I'm joking, yeah. brother. Yeah. Um. Okay. Uh. Let's see. What year were you born? 1950. 50. So you missed the rebirth of Israel by a couple of years. Did you know that Israel had been destroyed? Like growing up, did you know that it just came back to being? I, I no, was, I didn't know anything about Israel. And that great historic event uh, um, in uh, was it March fourteenth of of nineteen sixty eight or nineteen forty eight I think mm -hmm. it was, and, and I, I didn't know anything about that until I became a Christian and started learning those things. 
Okay. No, um, Israel was not a, never in my mind. I didn't think mm -hmm. about. Uh, I wasn't thinking about uh, except for politics and the Vietnam War and being a hippie and and all, all those things. Uh, the political, our political views, we had those formulating. But as far as theology, well, I, you know, we we looked at Buddhism and meditation and all those things that were trendy at the time. But but I never really got uh, was a great uh, in, in greatly into thinking about uh, our afterlife and that kind of thing. It, it was here and now and fun. It was all that mattered. Right. Just what's right in front of your face. Yeah. Um, one day at a time. Okay. So theology comes later. Um, just to move, just to get it out of the way, when did you meet and marry your second wife? I'm imagining it's your current wife, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. My, uh, uh, my wife, uh, Cindy, or Cynthia is her name. I, we, everybody, we all call her Cindy. But uh, I met her uh, about 1978. And we got married in 79 in uh, August 26th of 79. Uh, that was her birthday. I was, uh, at that time, I had come back from my job in Florida. And I had, uh, one thing that we skipped is that uh, in college, see, in college, I, I was, I was athletic, I, and I was, I, I had received a athletic scholarship for, to play tennis. But and then I joined a fraternity in college, Sigma Chi, and in this fraternity, one of the people was had a, a dojo, a karate dojo, and he offered free karate lessons to everybody in the fraternity, and I'm the one that took it. As I said, when I get interested in something, I get really obsessed with it. So I got involved in that, and, and I've been doing it since about 1970. I still do it every day. Uh, and since then, I've expanded into learning every martial art you can imagine just about. So I, I and over the years, I've actually owned and operated some martial arts schools. But the point I'm getting at is that uh, one of the once a person I met through the martial arts, uh, John Moran, became a good friend of mine uh, until recently when he's, he's died. But he, uh, he and I did a lot of crazy things and drugs and uh, criminal activities together. And, and it's amazing we didn't get killed. Actually, several of our friends with us did get killed. Uh, Gunfights and stuff like that. And, and some were in prison. But John didn't, uh, he survived until he died from, you know, alcoholism uh, uh, about two years ago. But uh, in my case, uh, because I met John, he, he was in a business, a sales business, and he was very good. And he got me involved in it. And I uh, basically, um, when I first started, I, bought, I might as well say it's the business that Chase, uh, Brother Chase, uh, mm -hmm. you know, who's banned right now, uh, Chase is in that business, it's time sharing. But, but I got involved in time sharing in, in its infancy. When there were only a couple of timeshare companies existing in the country and um, when i started in it one of the uh, owners or operators of the company that was uh, uh he told me he said look you uh you're not going to succeed at this you're honest you cannot be honest you're going to fail you have to have larceny in your heart if you mm. don't have larceny in your heart you're going to starve and because I had basically, I had, even though I was into sex, drugs, and all that, I, uh, be, at that time, I, I wasn't a horribly, you know, a criminal and, 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 and thinking uh, laws don't matter. All, uh, I, did, I did care about being honest. But once I realized that if I didn't become a liar, I wouldn't be able to earn a living in that business. So I started lying every day and to customers. And that's really what you have to do in that business. So I became an expert at lying and uh, and became very successful in that business. And I, I won all kinds of awards for sales, uh, but it was all dishonest. Mm. Uh, and uh, so my wife worked at one of these resorts, timeshare resorts, but she worked in the front desk like a, a receptionist. And I was taking uh, some people on a tour of the property to sell them. 
And as I toured the property and I walked through the hotel area, I saw my wife there for the first time and I was just smitten. I mean, she was just, uh, she was just beautiful. And I, first opportunity I had, I went over to it and asked her out in front of everybody, put her right on the spot in front of everybody so she, she couldn't say no. <laughs> and so that's how that, that's how I met my wife and how that got, got started. Uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, so that's the period where uh, you know, I continued using drugs, but we, I ended up moving to Hawaii uh, in the timeshare business, and I then ended up asking Cindy to join me there. And then with no plans of marriage, not even really feeling like we really were in love, she got pregnant. <laughs> and... Uh, um, in my, you know, in my generation, with no morals and values to consider, the first thing that I I thought and she agreed is we need to get an abortion because we never talked about marriage. We didn't ever express that we actually were in love. So we said Look, we need to get an abortion, and we were in Hawaii. So we got the looked in the phone book. That those were the days you had to look things up in a phone book. Oh, how horrible! And uh, we looked up for abortion and we found this abortion clinic. So we went to the abortion clinic to get an abortion. And they, uh, they, uh, they put us in a room and said, you've got to watch this movie first. And it turns out that it was an anti-abortion movie. And I had never learned anything about abortion one way or the other. I just thought abortion was a harmless thing you do. Mm -hmm. It's another type of birth control. I didn't know really what it was. So when, when I saw actually what abortions really were, I was so sickened by it, I couldn't, I didn't want to do it. And uh, thankfully, Cindy agreed. And I said, we need to get married and have this child. And that's what led to our marriage. And we got married a couple of months later in Hawaii and have our son that's the greatest blessing of our life who's 39 now and would be would have been aborted if we did not get deceived by the abortion clinic to thinking that they were going to give us an abortion rather than talk us out of it uh, that's a godsend right there yeah um let's see uh, to tie something together, something I've been studying that I'd like other people to look into that matches with your story. The sexual revolution led to the abortion epidemic that's going on, and that, that led to the transgenderism. And if you look these things up, they're the worship of Astaroth and Moloch, so, uh, and Baal, or Baal. So if people want to look that up on the side, please do. It's very interesting. Anyway, sorry, Luke, I didn't mean to sidetrack on your story. Um, but these, I think it's interesting, and some people might too. Yeah, I, um, I, do, I do have a playlist uh, titled "Abortion." I was about to get into that. Go ahead. And uh, I have the little testimony that I just shared with you about my experience and why my mind was changed uh, against abortion. Okay. And uh, and then I also have a, a maybe five or six videos explicitly showing what abortions really are. And uh, so if, if, if you send people to that playlist who don't understand this, what it really is, and that would be helpful. I think that if they see it and understand what it is, many people will have their mind changed the way my, my mind was changed about it. I wasn't right. a Christian at that time. It had nothing to do with my faith. It was just the idea it was disgusted me so much I couldn't do it. Right. Um, by all means, check out that playlist um, for abortion people. It's really important. Um, the Satanists and the Baal worshippers that are still around today and the Moloch worshippers and Kabbalists, they call it a sacrament. So it's an unholy worship of demons. Um, yeah. Anyway, just, so we'll go down that rabbit hole and be there all day. All right. Um, we've gotten through your second marriage and the birth of your son. Yeah. Um, speaking of your playlist while we're there. Luke, you have an amazing amount of videos um, on your playlists. He has a lot. By all means, check him out. He does excellent work and very in-depth. 
Um, do you go through regularly and clean that up, or do you go through and change your stance, or it, can you watch kind of how your thinking has evolved mm. while you're creating that? Yeah. Um, uh, well, uh, sometimes I, when I go to a playlist and I see that some videos have been uh, deleted or, or made private or something, I'll just take it off the playlist. But but if the, if the videos on my playlist that I've created myself, mm -hmm. uh, I uh, I have removed a few over the years uh, that uh, my my viewpoint has changed. But sometimes I leave up my old videos showing my old position because it's a legitimate position even though i don't hold it anymore it's fair to hold the position i don't resent people who believe what i used to believe for example but right. uh and it can show to illustrate that look this is what i believed and taught for 25 years and now i see it differently and this is what i believe and and, and teach and why why i've changed my mind so yeah, you will see, um, if you look through everything very carefully, you find a, a few things here and there where I've said something in the past that's different than what I'm saying now. Okay, thank you. Um, let me think about your playlist. Is there anything I want to touch on? Oh, yes, he's got a playlist called Interviews, and you should check that one out in particular to learn the people you're hanging out with. Um, very interesting stuff. Now, back to what we were doing. We've gotten through. Um, tell me about your son, if you don't mind. My son is, uh, uh, fortunately, uh, he, he still wants to be a big part of our life. He's Good. 39, and so many people, pardon me, so many people I know, their children have been nothing but problems for them, and and uh, and they don't the children don't even want to have any relationship with their parents any longer, and that's really heartbreaking. But uh, our relationship with our son has been fantastic, and and uh, uh, is, is still t fantastic. Uh, after I got saved, of course, I taught him about Jesus. And as a young boy, when he was, I guess he was around six years old when I when I became a believer, and he and of course he he believed. He, he wanted me to read him revelations all the time of course children love that's like a fantasy story you know uh, dr dragons and stuff but, but uh he learned the gospel and he and he and he got really good at uh bible study and even uh, apologetics uh, he, he's not involved in the faith now uh, I, he's just moved on and he it's it's that uh, i think that he's he became injured because he had a relationship that was uh, uh, a, a, a horrible betrayal by mm. by someone he loved, and their their whole relationship was based upon their shared faith and their their promise to you know they're going to get married and and uh, and uh, they're both very committed to their faith, and then this horrible betrayal, unfaithfulness that crushed him. And this is one of the reasons I tell everybody, I say, look, don't, do you really believe that it's impossible for someone to lose their faith or have doubt or even lose their enthusiasm for, for the faith? Even if they haven't lost their faith, they're no longer enthusiastic or involved because they've been crushed by something because they, they had a, a tragedy in their life and they say they can't deal with it. They understand how God could allow such a thing to happen to them. Uh, so, uh, I, I know there are people like that, that, uh, were as committed as you, brother Mark or me or Renee or anybody else we know who love the Lord, believe correctly. And then their, their faith wanes. If it didn't, faith didn't wane, their, their interest wanes. Uh, and it's because they get angry with God because of the hurt that they've gone through. Why didn't God spare them from going through that? So um that's that's what i think has happened to my son and, and to other people i've known and uh but my son is doing well he's done very well and he's uh i expect he'll be getting married fairly soon and have some children I'm, that's why i'm hopeful mm -hmm. hopefully he will <laughs> i'd love to have some grandchildren before we're too old to even enjoy them or uh but uh 
uh, he's very successful and he has great integrity and he's very intelligent and, and I even learned things from him. So, uh, yeah, that's a, Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, do you have any other children or siblings? No, we had one mm -hmm. and, uh, that's it. My wife didn't want to have any more. And, uh, oh, by the way, uh, okay. Something we should not, uh, fail to, to discuss is that, uh, uh, after I was married for two years to Cindy, Remember, we got married because she got pregnant. It wasn't the most ideal circumstances. We uh, we weren't really that compatible in a lot of ways, and uh, it was it was not a good, healthy marriage. And uh, because I was not a Christian, I would cheat on her, and I, I had these relationships, and I wasn't satisfied and happy with the marriage, even though I had a little boy that's two years old. Uh, I was got involved with other women and, and um, my wife ended up moving back to Connecticut where she's from temporarily. The same thing as my first wife, they go away. It's temporary. And then after six months, and she has my son for six months and I'm telling her, look, you need to return. I need you and my son back. And, and uh, she says, I don't want a divorce, but I'm not ready to come back. So what do you think I did? Mm. I'm same another thing. woman. I did the same thing I did with my first wife. I said, "Well, I'm. I, I don't have the patience. I cannot wait. So I'm going to. I divorced you. I divorced her. Right. So we got divorced, and I. My son was on the other side of the country, and my son and I, from the time he's born, he's been like a Siamese twin to me. He's like in my arms or on my shoulder, or on my back all the time. Everything I did, even, even when I'm playing a sport, he's on there. He learned all the sports I did and everything. And he's, he's like attached to my hip. We are very, very close. And so even when he's two years old, I feel this great loss because he's, I don't have him, but I have to move on. So I moved to Texas and I, because I had a job opportunity and I did, was doing really well financially and I ended up getting involved with another woman and getting a very uh, really loving this woman and having a wonderful relationship. We were very compatible. And, but I, I missed my son so much. I was making plans to go to Connecticut to see my son because even at two to three years old in that range, when I was talking to him on the phone, I could mm -hmm. tell that he's all messed up from this. He's starting to stammer a little bit. And I think, oh no, I, this is destroying, this hurting me so much. I have to go see him. And the girl I was with said, no, Paul, don't, don't go. Cause you'll end up getting back with your ex-wife. I said, that's impossible. It could, it's, it never, it could never happen. Don't worry. But when I went back there, my wife gave me the opportunity to get back with her and, and, and to have our family again. And that, that was more important than the other woman and anything else. And so, so we, we reconciled and we got back together and we didn't get remarried for many, many years. We just basically, we ignored the divorce and lived as, as a married couple and raised our son. And then quite a few years later, we ended up saying, well, let's, let's get remarried and make it, make it a legal marriage because you have to have these legal things uh, legal because of social security benefits and you know all the things that you you're, you're going to miss if you don't have an actual legal marriage so uh we did first time we got married on her birthday august 26th when we got remarried legally even though i consider that we were just separated for a while and even while we were got back together but not legally remarried i considered that we were married all those years i always considered my wife and uh but we I uh, got legally remarried uh, on my birthday the second time. So the first mm -hmm. time we were married on her birthday, the second time we were married on my birthday, November 19th. That's the same birth date as uh, Billy Sunday, the famous preacher. Oh, and, Billy Sunday. And Dr. Peter Ruckman. His birthday was November 19th. Ruckman. Yeah. Heard about him a little bit. 
Ruckman um, is uh, is a, a great great man in a lot of ways, but I eventually moved away from some of his some of his um, uh, basic uh, beliefs. I, I I ended up disagreeing, but I admire him very much still. Right. Um, I want all of the younger viewers to take note on the wisdom of Luke here. Mary on a birthday so that you don't forget all the dates tied together present easy to remember that's some wisdom right there yeah i'm very efficient i i, I mm -hmm. tie the birthdays the birthdays and the, the weddings together mm -hmm. that's being efficient it, it, that's wise you won't forget them that way and get <laughs> in i better not <laughs> see he knows you better not yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. We've covered a lot of your younger life. Is there anything from your non-believing life you'd like to cover that we haven't? Uh, well, I don't think I've. You, you've got uh, uh, my my interests as a kid and the things that I've uh, become. Uh, as I said, there's a few things in my life I get very interested in and I obsess and become really excellent at it and very knowledgeable. And so uh, there's been some sports and, and then there's been some subjects that I got interested in. Uh, but other than studying the things that I really developed an interest, the other things I did was just entertainment. I entertained myself with uh, partying and, uh, and, and sports. So no, that's, that's kind of, I guess I could summarize it up that way, but uh, uh, the, one of the main things in my life that has affected all, all, all the outcomes to get me who I am and where I am now is this overpowering uh, sexual drive that my dad warned me about, that I couldn't control, that led me into all kinds of things. And, and But I look back and I think, wow, uh, I was talking to one of my friends years ago and we were sitting, theorizing, what if... Well, what if you could go back in time and, and to a particular time and take a different direction, a decision you made and go differently? And would you like to do that? And I thought about it for a while. I figured, no, I, I don't want to change anything. For example, here, here, let's, here are this series of events. I was born November 19th, 1950. On December 3rd, 1950, the best friend I ever had was born in the house next door to me. He grew up, his name was Mark, and I named my son Mark. But he, Mark uh, and I grew up together like brothers. <laughs> he was as close as any brother to me. And we grew up together. And Mark is the one that started playing tennis and got me interested in tennis. And tennis led to my scholarship in, in college. And college led me into the fraternity and the fraternity led me into martial arts, and the martial arts led me into John Moran and to uh, me going into the time sharing business. The time sharing business led me into meeting my wife, Cindy. You see how everything is connected, and if one of those things was, was missing, my life would have gone a completely different direction. So in hindsight, no, I, I, I would not want to uh, change anything and uh, because I'm, I'm so happy with my son, my wife, my wife now, by the way, we're very, very happy. We've been happy for many years, but for most of our marriage, we were not happy at all. We're very unhappy. And even after we got back together, we were unhappy for a long time. But speaking for me, I stayed in it because I, my son needed two parents. I knew that. I was not going to have him in a broken family. So I sacrificed for many years for many, many years, I lived frustrated and angry because my wife and I did not have a good marriage, a good relationship, uh, and uh, uh, very resentful. Uh, and only after I became a believer did all these things change, my attitudes and some of these things. But that's what it took for me to get get over, over all those feelings. And uh, So uh, I guess I guess we've we've we covered everything until now the the new birth. Right. Hold on one second. Was Cynthia also known as Cindy 
Was she a believer or a God fearer when you met her? No, she no, wasn't, she wasn't. And for, for, for many, many years, she, uh, she, she went all the way. What, what first grade through 12th grade through Catholic school. Mm. And, and her family, of course, be very Catholic and religious Catholic Catholics. They, that's what she was ingrained with and resented it and hated it. Mm -hmm. But she did actually believe basically, but she hated it because of the way the nuns treated her, you know? Uh, but so, so she did believe Roman Catholicism. So she had some things right, but not the gospel. And, um, uh, so I'll, I'll get into that how it happened after, uh, after I became a believer and how it's affected her. Okay. Um, let me think if there's anything else we need to ask before we go down that road. Um, by the way, tell her that all the saints said hi and that we love her. Right, um, at this that. point, give me one second. Anybody in chat have anything they want to ask about his youth and non-believing Luke before we move on? Okay, we're going to take some steps forward, and if something pops up, we'll deal with it then. Is that okay, Luke? That yeah, sure. sure. All right. So tell us, oh, did he ever visit any youth groups as a child? Youth groups? Yes. Uh, oh, what is a youth group, though? I, I need a definition. Um, young believers, a group at no, a church for no, youth. No, no I, I, I wasn't a believer until I was 36 years old. So, uh, no, I wouldn't have gone to any youth groups. But I did, I did grow up with my mother being Roman Catholic. She did get us in, uh, be involved in going to uh, Catholic church. I did go every Sunday as a child to Catholic church. And I did go to catechism. It's the little classes they send kids to to learn about Roman Catholicism. So I had that kind of teaching and indoctrination and attending. I didn't ever become an altar boy. I got out of it before <laughs> before that point. Uh, but I did have that basic upbringing in Roman Catholicism. Okay, so you and your current wife both kind of had the Roman Catholic undertones. Yeah. Yeah. So you had a lot of law. Um, Mr. Bob says, if he wants to divulge, what was his non-believing name? My, my non-believing name? <laughs> yes, he's, uh, what's your real name, Luke, oh, before okay. you went to witness protection? Oh, all right, okay, I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you this. The, uh, remember I showed you the picture of my parents? And, yes. And, and I told yes. you their names. My father's name was Lester lee boozer and he was from texas um uh, he named me after him in a way lester and but my middle name was not lee my middle name was lynn so my dad's lester lee i'm lester lynn boozer now when uh when i was in kindergarten Remember I told you the good time I had in kindergarten? Mm -hmm. Want me to tell you something bad that happened in kindergarten? Hot lips, the, Luke. Go the, ahead, Lester. The first, the first thing you learn in school is the, they, how to call roll. And they say, okay, yes. raise your hand when I call your name. And they called my name out, Lynn Boozer. Mm. And I raised my hand. And my teacher said, you're Lynn? I thought that was a girl's name. Ouch. Can imagine a little boy, you know, six years old, being told in front of everybody, you've got a girl's name. Uh, ever since that moment, I didn't realize I had a girl's name. But at that point, I, I was so humiliated and re I resented my name. I hated my name for my whole life. So as the years passed, uh, uh, I toyed with going with my first name. Uh, Lester, but I didn't like the thing that can be done with Lester. Lester the molester. 
And so I said, well, let me go do what my dad did. Most people called him less. And I said, I don't want to be less. I'd rather be more, not more. Yes. See? So, and I don't want to be Lynn. That's a girl's name. So I couldn't make it work. So after both my parents were deceased and I knew their feelings wouldn't be hurt, I decided I'm going to pick a name that I like. And I went with Luke. So I've been going by the name Luke Very for good. probably 40 years. Everybody who's ever known me call, has called me Luke. If someone calls me Lynn now, it sounds so foreign and bizarre to me. And they, uh, um, they have, um, I'd say that, uh, that it's either someone from my way distant path as, as in my youth or, or someone in my family that slips up sometime and, and, and calls me by, but that's unusual. My family would call me Luke's for so many years that nobody makes that mistake anymore. All right. Um, so that's, that's the, the true story about, uh, you know, my name and how that happened. Okay. That's him and witness protection people. <laughs> okay. Um, Leo asked, could you tell us anything about your grandparents? No, that's the, that's one of my uh, great uh, sadnesses in, in life is that I never met any of my grandparents. My my father is from Texas, and uh, the only experience they had with my grandparents was I went back to Texas with my dad for the funeral of his father, but I never met his mother or his father. Uh, I have pictures of them. I never met my mother's parents. She was from New Mexico. I never met them. I don't even know hardly anything about them, except that my mother's mother was Hispanic. So my mother's part Hispanic and I'm part Hispanic. I don't look a part Hispanic, but I'm probably a quarter or an eighth something uh, Hispanic. Uh, but I never did get to meet any of my grandparents. And that's, uh, that's uh, to me, it's always been a, a sad thing missing. Mm, I apologize, Luke. Uh, I hate touching on those soft spots. Okay, that looks like all the questions. So now we can move on to believing Luke. So tell me how that came to be. Well, uh, and were you first, the first in your family that you know of? Yes, yes, definitely. Okay. Yes, I'm the first. The uh, uh, my mother died in December of 1986, and it was sudden. She was ill, but we didn't expect her to die suddenly like that. Uh, she just died in her sleep one night, and, and she had uh, she got emphysema. She smoked three packs a day for almost her whole life, and uh, she ended up getting emphysema and uh, being stuck in a chair and, and, and uh, with oxygen and all that. But she seemed like she was going to live a while. We didn't expect her to die like that, and it was shocked us all. But when my mother died, uh, it was the first loss I had to deal with. I never experienced anybody I loved who died yet. And it, 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 was, it was such a, uh, an event that I, I, I felt I need to be it serious. I need to find out what happens after we die. Is there a purpose to life? Of course, I, at this point, I... I looked at all, a lot of different types of religions a little bit here and there and stuff, but I, but I was pretty much Darwinist, uh, you know, Big Bang and all accident, all that, and the God of the Bible is probably not exactly right, and, and that uh, maybe there is some kind of creative force or something. I don't know, but uh, I didn't have any any faith, real faith uh, defined at all. But I, I needed to find out if. There is a purpose to life and what happens after we die. And it just so happens this was December that my mother died. And every December on TV, they play the Jesus movies. Mm -hmm. and I saw the movie Jesus of Nazareth in the past. But it, when this time when it came on, I had great interest in it. And I watched it carefully. And after... The movie was over. They rolled the credits on the screen. And the last thing on the screen said, for more information, read the Bible. I thought, that's what I should do. I need to read the Bible. And I started reading the Bible. And as I read the Bible, I reached a point. 
uh, reading the gospel accounts, and I know as I read the gospel of John, that's when I believed. And I was overwhelmed with just joy. And I, I wasn't, I wasn't overwhelmed with guilt and shame over sin or fear of hell. That motivates some people. But what it motivated me and inspired me to believe was when I understood the love of Christ, that he loved me so much that he would die for me. And uh, that was so powerful to me. So it was the love of Christ that drew me to him, not fear. Right. And see, I worry about anybody who uh, who doesn't have a wonderfully beautiful reaction, jumping for joy and screaming hallelujah. Um, I, I don't understand people like that. It's just my theory that if you uh, if you want to realize it, that you should, something yeah. should happen to make you very happy. Yeah, yeah I, I, I do think you're right. And I know what you're doing. You're repeating my own words back to me. And I, what I'm, when I say that, I know that I'm flirting with a, a real heresy because uh, we, we cannot impose any emotional reaction on every believer saying that if they did not respond the way I did, that their faith is, is not real. Um, we're, we, we are all different types of levels of emotions and the way that we respond to a level of emotion uh, is, is different for all of us. And so uh, it's, it would be no different than trying to impose on everybody that everybody must also have the changed life that one person experiences. And if their life doesn't change, for the better, the way that my life changed for the better, then I challenge their legitimacy of, of salvation. Uh, so I, I run the risk of, of that heresy when I say that I don't understand how someone cannot be jumping for joy if they truly understand what salvation is and that they actually have this guaranteed to them. I, I don't understand them not being so full of joy. And yet I, I know I can't impose that on everybody. It's it because it's it would be heretical to insist everybody have that same response that I had. Thank you very much for clearing that up for us. I really appreciate that. Um, Cause some people do, they, they take it too far and don't realize you're saying, this is what happened to me. I imagine everyone should be this happy, but I know it's not true. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Anyway. Uh, yeah, I know Elvis. Uh, all right. Let's see. So, so you believed at this point, um, what kind of what now, okay. The God shaped hole is, is being filled. What did that look like in your everyday life? Well, here's another thing that, uh, I don't want to impose on everybody. No, I'm, no. This I'm, is always, your I'm, always, I'm always very, very careful to, to argue against the false teaching that a person has to have uh, uh, a uh, repentant life of uh, 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 moving away from sin and towards good works, and uh, that that's not part of the, go the gospel at all. And yet it, it, ha it happens to some of us to varying degrees. Not, we're not all, we're all unique. It's not all the same. But in my mm -hmm. case, uh, it did have a big impact on me. Once I believed, remember how I told you when I get interested in the subject, I obsess over it and I get really, really involved in the subject. Yes. There's probably been about four or five subjects I could tell you about that in my life I've got great interest in and become a, a kind of an expert on it because I, I love the subject and I study it inside and out. Well, I, I just love the Bible. And I started taking the Bible with me everywhere. The first thing I had to do was I had to get out of the time show business because I could not lie to the people anymore. My, my conscience or the Holy Spirit, I don't know. But for some reason, I knew that I had to get a different profession. And, uh, and the other thing is that uh, I couldn't cheat on my wife anymore. My conscience wouldn't let me do that. So mm -hmm. what happened was, uh, remember I told you the resentment and the anger that I had? Yes. Well, that got worse. Mm. 
because because uh, now I'm in a position where I don't have a good marriage. I'm not satisfied in the marriage at all, and and yet uh, I can't even go uh, have a relationship with another woman now because my faith has changed me, and I can't do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I can't. It's like when Paul says, don't you know that the Holy Spirit is in you? And if you're with a, uh, uh, you're fornicating that the Holy Spirit is, I don't remember. I wish I had the right verse, but, but it's like you dragging the Holy Spirit through that with you. And uh, so uh, I, I couldn't do that. And so what I ended up doing was being uh, like an angry monk for many years because uh, I'm frustrated and, and uh, upset and with no with no means of, of, of satisfying getting any satisfaction and yet I uh, my my conviction to not commit adultery was was great that I couldn't do it I didn't I didn't want to do it I wanted to have sexual pleasure but I didn't want to fornicate and have commit adultery so these certain things like that uh change and also i quit using doing drugs completely i quit using any recreational drugs oh that's beautiful uh, uh, and uh so these are the things that changed in my life and when people talk about how when they got saved these desires and everything were taken away from them i can understand that mm -hmm. i had experiences like that but let's not require everybody to do the, what we did because then somebody who did even more than you is going to look at you and say, well, well, you think you did a lot. I did more than you. I changed more. You didn't change enough. What are you going to do? Get into a contest comparing each other how much we've improved? Uh, so what happened is it took maybe about three months or six months of believing before it became such a problem with my wife that uh, we she couldn't didn't walk me around i had to leave the house again i had we got separated again and uh, i i had to move out i moved into we were living in an apartment at that time so i got an apartment in the same complex maybe about you know 40 yards away there's another apartment i was in and my wife and son were in this one i had to get another place that only lasted for a month or two where i was separated but I had to get out because she couldn't stand me reading the Bible. She thought I lost my mind. That I'm not that some kind of a cult uh, Jesus freak nut now. And uh, uh, not only am I reading the Bible, but I want to go to church, and I want to, uh, not a Catholic church. I want to go to church, and I want to uh, and I want to actually study the Bible with other people. She couldn't cope with that, and uh, so, but. We were separated for a while, and then we got back, and she learned to tolerate me. And over the many, many years, uh, she helped me refine my gospel message because I had to overcome all of her uh, objections about works. I had to overcome that. For many years, I'm kind of practicing on her uh, and developing techniques to, to try to get it through to her. And finally, she did understand. And she says that she does believe now. But who knows what another person really believes? But she, uh, she understands that the Bible does say that works are not, uh, do not factor in our salvation. But uh, it took a lot of effort in repeating myself and finding a different nuance, a different, uh, different jargon, uh, different subtle ways of expressing things to try to get these points across to her uh and uh and then uh, uh and i and i started witnessing to all my family and friends in the beginning i was a little bit shy about sharing my faith i met a guy at mcdonald's one time a stranger and he and, and somehow we got on the subject and he was real he was real uh public about it and at that point, it was I was still a little bit private in my faith. I wasn't uh, confident or, or uh, uh, 
enough to, to go out and just start telling strangers about it. But this guy was a stranger. And he starts telling me about it. I said, yeah, that's what I believe. We were, we were having fellowship. But he, uh, I recognized that, hey, something's wrong here. I'm not, I should be not keeping my faith like secret from the world, even though I did tell some family and friends. And uh, so I started really studying uh, apologetics and, and how to, took a class on how to be an evangelist called um, um, the Evangelism Explosion. It was, I was going to the Nazarene Church at that time. And it was Evangelism Explosion by D. James Kennedy. And even today, the technique I learned in that class is the one I still use today. And that's the diagnostic questions when you ask someone, are you certain you're going to go to heaven? And if so, why? That's all we need to do. We need to ask a person if they are certain and based on what. And if they don't have certainty, then they don't understand the gospel. The gospel is the certainty that you're guaranteed eternal life because what Jesus did for you. And, and, uh, and if they don't know why, it's be only because of Jesus, not because of your, your qualities at all. And because uh, what he did for you and his promises to you. That's the only reason. If you don't get that kind of answer from someone, you know you've got a problem with their, their belief system. And you know where, where to go in terms of trying to show them the scriptures uh, if they care. A lot of people don't care what the Bible says because they don't believe the Bible is the word of God. So it doesn't matter what you show them from the Bible. But if they do think the Bible has some validity, then you can show them in the Bible the verses that refute works salvation. Right. Um, Stacy Cook needs our prayer, people. Um, her significant other is jealous of how close she's gotten with Jesus, much like Luke's story. So if we could pray for her, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, Stacey. Um Now, Luke, you said you were shy about sharing your faith, but I've heard tales that you were on the uh, Street Preachers team there in Las Vegas, correct? Yeah. 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 Um... Now, that, this is December of 1986 when I got saved. And for a few months after that, I had these initial problems in my family, the shock of the, being a born-again Christian in the family now, and, uh, uh, and then um, gradually accepting, accepting of it uh, and sharing it with my family. And then um, in, uh, I did a lot of studying, uh, and I had some fellowship with church, I was going to a lot of different churches, trying to find good churches. There aren't very many. And, and I had private fellow, private Bible studies at my house. But then I started telling, talking to the Lord, saying, Lord, work is preventing me from working for you. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know what I needed to do. But I knew that uh, I needed to get to work for the Lord. Not because I have to do it for salvation, but because we're all called to some kind of works for him. And I knew that, but I didn't know what work I should be doing. Uh, but I prayed the Lord. I said, Lord, bless me financially. If you bless me financially enough so that I can quit my job and not need to work, the time that would go normally into work, will go into working for you. I'll become a minister. I don't know what ministry I'm going to do, but that was what I'm telling the Lord. And so he blessed me. And I, I, I started buying up all the real estate. I couldn't Las Vegas before the bur the bubble. I mean, before the boom. I bought all, a bunch of real estate before the boom. And then it boomed. And I got wealthy enough that I could retire. Instead of waiting to 65, I was able to retire at 54. So that was 2004. I quit my job, and I'm not rich by any means, but my the money at least allowed us to me to quit work, work early, even though I can't live an extravagant life. Uh, we can pay our bills, and we can we're not going without, but we're uh, uh, we have what we need, and, and I have free time. So with my free time, what am I going to do now? I I told the Lord I'm going to be a minister. Well, at this time, I'm seeing on TV this show called The Way of the Master, Ray Comfort and Kirk Cameron. 
And I got real interested in what they were doing, their evangelism and their street preaching stuff. And, and, uh, and this time, uh, and then I ordered their books and their materials. I got a bunch of DVDs and CDs and books and everything from Ray Comfort. And I learned all those techniques and everything else, but I saw the problem. <laughs> they got all these great techniques, but they got the wrong gospel. But I took the basic techniques and I went out into the streets. And if, if you've seen their program, they go out and interview people. And they conduct it like an interview. They do recording it and interview people and ask them, uh, uh, can I ask you a few questions? Uh, uh, you know, uh, do you think you're a good person? Are you, well, have you ever, have you ever lied? Have you ever stolen? That's the technique. And they do it in the, kind of an interview format. And so I started doing that. And, and then when I was doing that, I discovered there are actually street preachers out in the streets doing other kind of street evangelism. And I got to know them. And then I, I started uh, working closely with them. And eventually I ended up being recognized as the street preacher of the year in this nationwide street preacher organization. What year and was that? I'd say that's 2005 or 2000, or maybe 2006, 2006, or maybe either 2006 or 2007, one of those years. And that's the time you see me street preaching in the wheelchair in my videos. Right. And that's because my arthritic back got so bad that I was semi paralyzed. I couldn't stand for more than 30 seconds. So, uh, uh, but I got real involved with these street preachers and they'd come to Las Vegas and I'd let them stay at my house and we'd go out street preaching, especially New Year's and 4th of July and the big holidays. You'd get 20, 40, 50 street preachers from around the country coming here and we'd go out and do this street preaching together. But the problem is they're no different than Ray Comfort. They're still, they're preaching the works salvation, most of them. And I, I got, I got very close with the leader of the group, um, Bible Jim, is his name Jim Weber, and uh, the other one that's kind of the their leader was Reuben Israel, and I got to know all the street preachers really well, and I liked some of them and some of them I didn't. Uh, some of them were horrible people. The way that they treat people, the the, the disdain they have for people, it was it was horrible. Uh, but I was arguing with Jim. I said, look. I can't be part of this because they're preaching the false gospel. And, and Jim says, well, at least they're doing something. Huh. Most Christians are doing nothing. At least they're doing something. And I said, Jim, I would rather have them do nothing. Right. Because what they're doing is not good. It's harmful. They're repelling people away from Jesus. They're not drawing people to Jesus because they're hateful. They're right. vulgar. They're calling people homos and, 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 and dykes on bikes. And, and just, and they're, they're so rude and insulting and, and that, that they're turning people away from Jesus. And I, I left the organization and, and started doing it just myself. And one other guy I was able to draw away. You see him in my playlist. Uh, uh, evangelism is street preaching how to brother Frank. He and I worked together for quite a while until we had a falling out over, over hyper dispensationalism. But uh, he and I worked together. And then when that fell out, I was street preaching by myself. And I finally reached a point where I kind of got on YouTube. And I realized that uh, this is a better environment for me. Uh, and uh, I transitioned gradually from did less and less street preaching and more and more YouTube until I'm not street preaching, but I'm just doing this. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, leading into your playlist that you have, um, did that how how many years of study would you say you put into it before you became a public minister? Uh, let me see. So from from eighty six till. Uh, 2005 or let's say December to December. So let's say 2004. So that's 14, 18 years, 18 years. Now during those 18 years, I was still witness to my family and friends. It was no secret who I was and what I believed and every opportunity, but also 
you have family and friends when you tell them about Jesus, they say, okay, that's fine. I find, you know, I, it's good for you, but I don't hear about it. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, you have to respect if they don't want to hear about it. But then you find out five years later, they're asking you about it. Ten years later, because the timing in their life was not right then. Now, at a certain point, they reach a point like I did. My mother died. I needed answers. They're not at a point where they need answers yet. They're not seeking it. But I've had many people that didn't want to hear about Jesus the first few years. And then 10, 20 years later, now they're all interested and they want to know. And I've had several friends and family members come to faith, you know, that I didn't think would, but did. Okay, so 18 years before you started your ministry. Um, any advice for those of us who are young but want to share the gospel on how to go about it? What's a, what do you think is the best way for a young person to get started? Now, this is going to sound bad. It's going to sound arrogant. But um, there, there's a verse in the Bible about people who have zeal without knowledge. And I think this idea that you've, you've uh, you kind of dug it up out of me and, and discovered that it was 18 years before I decided I'm going to go out and start publicly preaching and having a public ministry. It's 18 years of study. Uh, not that I was, didn't talk to anybody at all, but, but uh, you, you know, at that point, it became full-time and uh, really uh, official. I'm a minister. And uh, too many people, they just get saved. And because they're, they're full of zeal, they want to go out and, and start teaching. Now, the gospel is so simple that you don't have to have a lot of knowledge to, you know, to believe, to be saved. You don't have to have a lot of knowledge to teach them the simple gospel. But I encounter a lot of people on YouTube that are very young. Sometimes they're young in years. Sometimes they're just young in the faith. And they want to teach. And uh, James, you know, I'm not a big fan of James in some ways, but James does say, uh, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. And I see the, the, uh, the default in, in humanity is the exact opposite. We're uh, quick to anger, quick to speak, and slow to listen. So that would be my advice is, if you're going to just share the gospel with someone, wonderful. Share it with everybody who has ears to hear. If they don't have ears to hear, move on. Don't get all hung up with an individual, but move on and find someone who does have ears to hear. Just focus on the gospel. But trying to teach people all these. I had a young street preacher join me years ago and kind of like wanted to be my apprentice. And, and he took, came to my Bible study at my house for years. And, uh, he wanted to be a street preacher. And I, when he started preaching, he did, he made the first, the same mistake I did. You know, when the first time I street preached, it was such an embarrassment. I think back on it and I'm, I'm ashamed of myself. I didn't have any preparation at all. And I just went out there and said, I'll let the Holy Spirit tell me what to say. And it was, it was so bad that uh, I don't even want to repeat the things I was saying, but, uh, I was so shook up by that that I decided I'm going to do the best. The Lord deserves the best for me. So I took the time to write out a, a sermon for my street preaching. It was over 20 pages of, you know, uh, text, number 12 text, 20 pages. And I memorized it word for word, 90 minutes word for word. And I developed it. I, I could speak it as an orator and I would stand up on a on a platform in the street and, and give this message with all the street preachers I'm giving this message for 90 minutes but guess what as the people were walking by some people would were there for five minutes or ten minutes but a lot of people were just walking by and so what why am I giving a 90 minute sermon to people who are listening to 90 seconds and they're gone it's stupid. 
I realized that I wasn't preaching for them. I was preaching for my own ego and to impress the street preachers. Mm. Look, look at street preachers. Look at how much I know. I've got so much content. Mm. I've got all this theology in my message and they loved my message and I loved it. And it's all true, but it was pointless because an evangelist is not a pastor. A pastor will teach you all theology. An evangelist tells you it's if it's angel, even evangelist. Angel means messenger. Eve means good. The one who has the good message. And the good message is simple. Christ crucified. That's it. And <laughs> uh, and how long does it take to say that? So when I learned my lesson, I would I learned if you watch my videos on street preaching, you don't see the 90 minute message. You see that I try to present the gospel in like, you know, uh, 30 seconds at a time, 60 seconds, two minutes, something, depending upon how long the people are sticking around, try to get them the basic things they need to hear in the shortest amount of time. And that's why I, I learned it's necessary because you don't have an audience for 90 minutes. Uh, so I had to teach this young street preacher who was making the same mistake I made. He started street preaching and teaching them about end times and all this stuff. And, you know, uh, I, I, I said, look, you're, I, I had to give, tell just what I told you. You're not a pastor. If you want to be an evangelist, you have to accept the fact that your message is short and simple and it's redundant. You don't get to tell them all, impress them with all your vast knowledge of the Bible. You just need to repeat this one short message over and over and over again. It's redundant. And you're, if you can't do that without getting bored, then go get a church to be a pastor so you can teach them everything. But if you want to be an evangelist, you got to say the same message over and over again. If you don't have the right attitude to repeat yourself over and over, then don't be an evangelist. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wisdom, Luke. You probably saved at least 10 people a whole lot of trouble. <laughs> um, and I found that true, too. Christ and him crucified. Now, when you're dealing with ministry and not evangelism, since we now know what that is, that's the quick get them hooked and point them at the gate. When you're dealing with ministry, would you say that what is the most important part of ministry? Is it the knowledge, the wisdom, the love? The like, what do they need to see from you um, to be the most impactful? Uh, Jesus said, I do not think I came to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a, uh, uh, as a ransom for many. And the word serve, uh, some translations have the word to minister. I came to minister. Okay. And the word minister means to serve. And Jesus gave us an example, and a lot of, a lot of examples. But the greatest example is he washed the feet of the apostles. Peter said, no, you're not washing my feet. But he says, if you don't let me wash your feet, you can't be part of me, part of my, this at all. So, um, uh, Jesus demonstrated how to serve under the most humiliating, humbling example he could give. And so uh, that's what we need to do. That, and keep in mind that we're here to serve not only the church, but the world. And, and uh, how do you serve? I don't know. Yeah, everybody has to find out because Paul says we're, we're not all the same. The body has many parts. And, and really, the part that seems to be the most, uh, you know, unnecessary, that's not as not, not, not getting all the attention and glory, like the guy that stands up getting all the attention, the star of the program. No, that might not. We need to give glory to the person who's been in the background and only encouraging people. The encur ministry of encouragement is one of the most uh, unrecognized ministries and valuable ministries. I value it. When people over the years have sent a comment to me, say, I, I think you've been down and I, I want you to know, uh, cheer up, you're helping some people. You've helped me. And, and, and that kind of encouragement is such a blessing. And so I don't know what other people's ministry should be. That's why I say uh, everybody's called to be a minister, but we're not all the same. So the first thing you need to do after your, your initial faith 
is ask the Lord, reveal to me your plan for me. How do you want me to serve you? Because Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 tells us that we're saved by grace through faith without any works required, so we can't boast. But 10 says that we're also called to do good works. We should be doing good works. That's the whole point of us becoming a child of God, to serve God. So uh, you need to pray and ask the Lord, reveal to me the ministry you have for me. Probably not going to be like mine. It probably shouldn't be like mine. Uh, so I'd say find out. And then once you find out what your gift is, then get busy doing it because it'll be a, a labor of love. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brother Luke. I really appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> while we're here for the, the the encouragement part of it, and you said that was very important to you. Chat room, I would like for you, if you've ever received something spiritual through Luke, would, would you say amen, hallelujah, just something in the chat to give him a little encouragement, please? Um, <laughs> Now, moving forward, um, and yes, I, I totally agree with you. It should be different for each person. Um, <clears throat> and I'm glad you mentioned spiritual gifts. What would you say your spiritual gifts are? Uh, teaching. Teaching? I'm a teacher. I remember my, my pursuit in life from co college was education. My degree is in education. Uh, after college, I went off and became a motivational speaker on health and physical fitness, and I was teaching. And um, so I, I had this ability my whole life, uh, even before college, I was teaching. I was a tennis teacher. And so I, I have, I've always had a talent for teaching. And I knew that once I went into the ministry, I said, I'm supposed to be teaching, but what do I want? To, what do I need to teach? What what good is it to teach anybody anything about the Bible unless they first learn about salvation? <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't do you any good to, to get, make them not knowledgeable or feed them and clothe them and uh, do all these wonderful things if you neglect that they get born again. So uh, that's been that was in my initial my initial uh, effort in uh, ministry. And then when I got on YouTube, my channel was initially all about evangelism, nothing else. It was never my intention to start teaching on all the other theological subjects. Uh, but as people got to know me and watch me and listen to me, they started asking me questions about all these things. And I tried to avoid them because every time you get a theological question, uh, you're opening up, you know, a can of worms. Because all theological questions have at least two or three answers, possible answers, and different groups of people will say argue about which is the correct understanding. So and I knew anytime I dared to give an answer, I was going to satisfy some people and other people will, will hate me. And that's been my experience is that there, my greatest regret about the church is dogmatism. This is when I, we, we get back to the, the believer that is uh, zeal without knowledge is, is sometimes people, they get saved and they start studying and then they, you know, I have three dogmas. In the Church of the Eternally Secure, we have three dogmas. Talk and doctrine, we have three dog, dogmas. And that is, Jesus is eternal God Almighty. He's not a created being, he's the creator. Uh, salvation is received as a free gift, it's not earned through religious works. And eternal security. So those are the dogmas. Those are things we say, we insist you agree upon these basic things. That's what Christianity is, agreeing on these things. And uh, all other things, we don't have to agree upon them. Liberty on everything else. So uh, the problem is that most people, as soon as they start getting serious about their Christianity, they start getting more dogmas. They don't just have these three dogmas. They start developing a dogma on eschatology, a dogma on a Bible translation, a dogma on this and that, and pretty soon they got five, ten dogmas. And every dogma means you've got to agree with them or else you're a heretic. 
And so now with Cock and Doctrine in my program, we, we, we have this, this premise. Uh, I told Matthias in one of my talks with him, uh, I, I've confessed to him uh, several times when we started doing our thing together, I said, this is a, a, an experiment and I believe it's doomed to failure. It cannot last. There's going to come a point where we get a question and disagree, and it all falls apart because we can't tolerate a disagreement. And I, I think that's that's been the pattern. That's what happens every time. Eventually, you find some area you can't you can't agree, and you, you, you break up. That's why we have thirty thousand denominations. And uh, now, after more than a year, and being able to answer probably, let me see. 50 weeks times say four questions that's probably about 200 questions two or 300 questions between renee matthias daniel and myself 200 questions and probably half the time we don't have a, a unanimous agreement we have some kind of division and yet we have peace and respect and charity all that no no disharmony because we disagree on some non-essential question and that uh, Matthias says, Luke, it's not an experiment. It's it's a blueprint. A blueprint. It's a model for everybody else. Everybody else on YouTube, can you please use it as a model and say, let's agree on these core doctrines and let's give liberty on everything else and not call each other heretics just because we don't agree on all these 100 other things. It's beautiful. Um, yes, shout out to the rest of the Church of the Eternally Secure, um, which I hope you all in the chat are all members of. It's the only way to be. <laughs> um, I had a question, and now it flees my mind. You'll think of it. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry, viewers, too. It just poof, gone. That's never happened to me. I've never lost my train of thought once. All right. Well, see, I meant to take notes because a wise man told me to take notes once, but I forgot to completely. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, uh, um, oh, teaching. You, you said you love to teach. So could you do me a huge favor? And I don't know if you've studied this or not, but I have a sneaking suspicion that you have. Could you teach me a little bit of the history of the Bible and how we got it to our hands? Oh. Uh, so that we all have it to read? Well, I'll give, I'll give, I can give you a real short thumbnail uh, sketch of it, of course. Is Whatever that, uh, you want to give us. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, the Bible is not a book. The Bible is a consolidation of 66 books. And these 66 books were, were written by uh, about over 40 different authors over about a 1500 year span over on three different continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. And, uh, but, and, and, and men from many different walks of life fishermen, prophets, kings, generals, uh, historians. And yet, with all that in mind, it, it has a common theme from beginning to end. And, and the, the, the theme is, man has a problem he can't solve, but God's going to provide a savior for us. And that's the message we get from the beginning when we when we see that uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and then we go to the the, the bloody coat the coat uh, given to adam and eve to wear the animal skin the picture of uh, uh they can't solve the problem by sewing fig leaves together to cover their nakedness they needed that wasn't satisfactory they needed god to provide the covering and it required a, a bloody death to to do it to cain and abel when uh, uh, Cain 
presented to God the works of his hands. Look at all the work I did for you. And, and Abel provided God a blood sacrifice. And God said, the blood sacrifice is what satisfied me, not your works. And on and on. I have a play this titled The Bloody Trail. The Bloody Trail. Those examples and 20 more like it throughout the history of the Bible. The God showing us that what was needed is God to intervene for us. Uh, the apostles asked Jesus, how is it possible for anyone to get saved? And Jesus says, with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. But the Bible is telling us that we need to come to the realization that it is impossible for us to solve this problem, sin and death. We're all sinners, so we're separated from God. Sin is the barrier separating us from having a relationship with God. We can't remove that. We can't solve that problem. Death is something that we're, we're born with. We're all born with the sentence of death on us. We've inherited it. And so the problem of sin and death is something we can't fix. But God loves us so much, he came to and intervened in the intervention on our behalf. And he said, all solve the problem of sin and death. All pay for their sins. All give them the, the gift of eternal life as a free gift. They trust me for it. So that's the message that we see in pictures and shadows in the Old Testament and then clearly uh, illustrated and shown us through history of the New Testament. And uh, uh, so the Bible was uh, originally written and then it was carefully uh, copied over and over again, hundreds and then thousands of times by scribes who were the most scrupulous people to get every jot and tittle perfect. If it wasn't perfect, it was a whole thing. All the work they put into to copying of this was, was thrown away because it had to be perfect and preserved. And then finally, when we have all these manuscripts, we have the printing press, the Gutenberg Press, was their first Bible actually printed, and that gave us a revolution so that everybody could have these scriptures. There's no excuse. The scriptures are available to everybody now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, how many people do you think died to put that book in our hands? Oh, well, countless. Yeah. And it's, uh, they're still dying today. I mean, throughout all the church, this is where I think people go wrong thinking that um, the church somehow has to be spared a, a tribulation. God's going to spare us. Well, first of all, God is not inflicting any harm on, on, the, on us, but, uh, you know, Satan and the uh, sin, all that does take will take its toll on on the church. We've never been spared that through from the apostles, through the early ch church history, to all of church history, uh, and through the, uh, the the Reformation and the uh, Inquisition, and even today. I mean, you, we've got Fox's Book of Martyrs gives you a detailed account of all the atrocities done to believers torturous, horrible deaths inflicted upon them. And today we've got the books uh, uh, Jesus Freaks, Volume 1 and 2. And that's, that's an account of modern times. Today, things are going on. People, Christians today, they're being persecuted and tortured and murdered for their faith. So I forgot your question, but uh, that's... Oh, it was about people dying to make sure we had the Bible. Oh, yeah, yes. You, you know, people have always died because of their faith. They continue to die and until Jesus comes again uh, and there's a resurrection and the judgment and eternity. We can expect that to continue, I think. Right. Um, in all your Christianity, have you ever brushed up against or been part of Lordship Salvation? Uh Personally, when I came to faith, it was believing in grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone. I understood it from reading the Bible myself. It was obvious. I didn't have any other misinterpretation on my own. And fortunately, thank you, Jesus, when I when I first started learning uh, and studying the Bible, 
I found I was commuting to work at, at a particular time where I, when I turned the radio on in my car, there was a national radio program called the Bible Answer Man. And a wonderful man, Dr. Walter Martin. And his, uh, he was the Bible Answer Man for like 40 years. And I listened to his radio broadcast. And then I ordered all of his CDs. And I learned his, and I read his book, Kingdom of the Cults. And I understood the false teachings uh, of, of the various cults and false religions and false uh, sects. Uh, and, I, and, and, and so uh, I, I was able to get my first teacher, if I would say, was, was him and, and his, his salvation, the, the person of Jesus and the means of salvation, he has that right. All, all the other theological subjects, I may not agree. I don't agree with Walter Martin or Dr. Ruckman or anybody else entirely. But on the, who is Jesus and how do we get saved, he, he got it right. And so that reinforced my uh, immediate understanding. And uh, um, but no, I've never I've never gone through any period where I thought that works. So the lordship heretics never. Uh, were able to like influence me. And I know that some people, they come to faith. I think they're really saved, but they don't know the Bible. They just, they just know the bare minimum just so they can get saved. And then they start be listening to the wrong people. And because they don't know the Bible, they get all these experts with all this knowledge. And they're, uh, it's, it's like a, a man fighting a child. This babe in Christ does not have the ability to refute the Lordship heretics who studied for years promoting that heresy, and they can uh, they impress the the new believer with all their knowledge, and the new believer is not capable to refute it, and they end up believing in Lordship even though they they believe the truth initially. And so we have uh, believers in apostasy, and uh, we, we know we, we we know people that don't believe that's possible. They don't believe a, a, a believer could go into apostasy. I believe a believer can go into apostasy. I believe a believer can uh, uh, have their faith uh, shipwrecked and even lose their faith or their faith wanes uh, or they lose enthusiasm. All these things happen to believers, uh, true believers. Um, but what they need to do is remind themselves of what they believed initially. If we just remind ourselves, well, what did I believe in the very beginning? My, the, the, the gospel and then uh, then they can then everything can be restored because if a person doesn't have a blessed assurance that's the saddest thing and you have to ask yourself if you don't have the blessed assurance if you don't have the certainty and the confidence I'm going to heaven nothing's going to ever change that then then you don't even understand the gospel now it's possible maybe you understood it and you got saved and now you're confused I think that's possible, but may, it's also possible that you never understood it from the beginning, and it's important you understand it now, that without the certainty and the guarantee, you don't even know what the gospel is, because the gospel is the guarantee that you're going to go to heaven because Jesus did it for you, and it's certain. Right. Um, would you say the resurrection is our assurance because he lives, we will live, or we do live? Yeah, there's a verse that says we're just uh, by his resurrection, we're justified. I don't take that to mean that we're because of his resurrection, we're saved. We're saved because he paid for our sins and we've received the gift. But the resurrection, it, it, the justification and the, uh, the connection between justification and the resurrection is our faith is justified because the resurrection proves to us it's, it's real. So in other Thank words, you. Uh, Jesus, Jesus, why should I believe in Jesus? I mean, come on. I mean, that, that's some kind of a ridiculous fairy tale. Well, if you do the research and you find out about the resurrection and what happened to the apostles and how they changed, and then you realize that the, he promised he would raise himself from the dead as a sign to prove his claims, and then he did it, and that the apostles all changed from cowards to bold preachers preaching unto their own deaths, and, and you can realize then that because of that resurrection giving you the proof that he is God and Savior, that you're justified in believing. That you've given he's he's given you good reason to believe because he proved it. Would would you say that's the importance of the keys that he came back with? 
to show that he had conquered death in the grave? Yeah, yeah. The, re the resurrection, uh, you know, people have argued w about the resurrection and so many different things over the years about this resurrection. But the significance of the resurrection is that's the proof that Jesus offers us to give us confidence that, that we're putting our faith in, in him and him is the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Celine says that when you kissed your kindergarten love, it reminded her of a Family Guy episode when Stewie and his crush and they lived together in a cardboard house. Yeah. Okay. My my nickname is Stewie. No, I'm just kidding. Stewie. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, thank you, by the way, for that uh, breakdown of the gospel. I really appreciate it. Um, do you want to mention some of the other playlists that you have and what you teach on? Okay, yeah, that's uh, um, the, um, the I have, a, I think, over 60 playlists. Ooh. To me, the, one of the great disappointments of my YouTube work uh, is that uh, so few people have uh, gone through the playlists. And I think all, every playlist is important and valuable. But if you go through the playlists and you find a playlist of interest, that you will carefully watch it from beginning to end. Maybe maybe the playlist has five videos that myself and maybe a group, myself and others, we have a group discussion discussing the subject or a playlist where we're working our way through a particular book of the Bible, verse by verse. And, and uh, but in addition to the videos I produce, many of these playlists have videos uh, that I've collected from other people. So it's, it's, it's sad to me that few people are taking advantage of it. And, but I do get notes. I've had notes from quite a few people. Uh, Brother Leo is one of the most recent ones. Look at several of the playlists and, and, and tell me how much he's uh, enjoying and benefiting from them. Uh, so uh, a lot of work and effort has gone into these. Uh, I'd say my, my playlists about um, what is the state of the dead, the playlist uh, on uh, James and Paul, my viewpoint on uh, that, uh, the book of James and how to understand that. Uh, my, my, my playlist on Paul o against Paul onlyism. Uh, um, uh, hold on one second. Playlists. Can you explain what Paul onlyism is? Yeah, there's a uh, there's a term uh, that many people have heard called dispensationalism. And dispensationalism is the, is is the belief that throughout the history of the Bible that for a certain period of time, God was going to deal with man in a certain way. And then at a certain point in time, God will change how he deals with people based upon different criteria. And these are called dispensations. Okay. During this period of history, God dealt with us one way. And this period of history, God deals with us another way. And much of it has to do with not just believing, but also in our ability to do religious works. So uh, there are various types of dispensationalism, but that's probably the most common uh, viewpoint. Uh, and I learned a lot about dispensationalism because of Dr. Peter Ruckman's uh, teachings and uh, uh, Clarence Larkin's drawings uh, illustrating these dispensations. Uh, but uh, I'm not a dispensationalist. I was. Uh, I believe dispensations in the Bible should be understood as what the word actually means. The, the root word is dispense. Dispense means you're passing out something, dispensing it. The uh, uh, T-I-O-N is a, is a suffix that means the act of. So dispensation is the act of dispensing or the act of passing out something. But what is being dispensed? Revelation from God. Dispensation means that God is in the act of dispensing revelations to the world. And in the beginning, he started dispensing information uh, in the garden, and then with Cain, Cain and Abel, and then with Moses, and so on and so on, and until we finally now have the full revelation through the Bible and the New Testament, God has dispensed all this information, everything we need to know, uh, completely and, and uh, precisely. Um, but Paul onlyism 
is taking the idea of dispensationalism, the wrong view on dispensationalism, to an extreme viewpoint, where they're saying dispensations is there's a particular dispensation in wearing right now that is unique. Oh, and all of history has never been like this before. Now we have the grace of God being dispensed to the world, the church age. God is being gracious today. But in times past and in times future after the church, that, that there's no more dispensing of grace, that it, it's going to be based upon uh, following laws. And uh, that's, uh, well, hyper dispensationalism says that the, tr the age we're in right now, the church age, the dispensation of the grace of God is only the Apostle Paul. Jesus didn't teach it. John didn't teach it. Peter didn't teach it. Nobody taught it but Paul. That the only one teaching us today, the only one we listen to, is Paul. So they say Romans through Philemon is for us. Everything else, you can learn something from it, but it has, it's not really to us at all. So you can almost get away with it, just ignoring it. Only Paul. Paul onlyism. And I have a playlist refuting Paul onlyism. Every tenet of Paul onlyism, I refute and prove the scriptures. So uh, if you're someone that is thinking that it's only Paul's writings that uh, are important for us today uh, for salvation, then you need to go to my playlist, Paul Onlyism Debunked. But I'd say those playlists probably, they come to mind as being the most significant because these are things that I am almost unique in, 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 in saying, I'm coming against this. I'm coming against a particular understanding of the book of James. Here's how I see it. We should view it uh, through a historical lens of the, tra the transitional period of the church history, how it fits in. Uh, this is how I see the Apostle Paul. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, he's not elevated above everybody else, but he is unique and, 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 and very, very special and important because he says, you're saved by believing in Jesus, just like Jesus said, and Peter and, and John. But I'm telling you, if you add anything else to it, it's ruined. It's no value. You've got to keep it 100% pure, unadulterated Jesus, nothing else. Otherwise, you've ruined it. That's Paul's main contribution, is saying, don't add anything else to it or you've ruined it. Abide. Yeah. Um, Hendricks had a good question. Brother Luke. Have there been moments of intense tribulation you've been under that made you consider leaving Jesus in exchange for getting some carnal sense of peace? No, no, uh, no, Hendrix. Uh, I've never, ever, ever had any feelings where I want, don't want to be part of Jesus. And I never thought it was even possible because I believe that when you're born again, just like Jesus told Nicodemus, you can't go back in your mother's womb and undo it. <laughs> I know that. So those kinds of thoughts have never entered my head because my salvation is irrevocable and irreversible by God or by me. Okay, let's, let's pose that question a little bit differently. Have you ever thought of hiding your light so it didn't shine so bright due to tribulation or persecution? No. No. no, I've okay. never thought of that. But but regarding persecution, if you want me to say something about it, mm -hmm. I, have, I have heard my heart broken uh, on, in the church many, many times. Uh, I have developed some very close relationships with probably 20 people. If I gave you all their names, you'd be surprised. Some of my closest friends on YouTube that worked closely with me. And, and some of them, it's behind the scenes that nobody knows about, but I've had private conversations for 50 hours of conversations on my telephone. And then there comes a point of disagreement and they shun me. And that, that kind of thing has broken my heart and that's made me uh, be, de develop almost a fatalistic uh, attitude that all relationships are are, and it's inevitably going to fail at some point. And it's only this experience where the church is eternally secure over the last 14 months that has given me confidence that relationships can last if we agree that we're going to tolerate our, our opinions on minor doctrines. If we don't agree on that, then there's going to come a point of disagreement where you, you don't tolerate the other person's point of view. And that's, that's what 
breaks up uh, relationships. Absolutely. Would you say early Protestantism had the same kind of philosophy, the five solas we agree on, and the minor stuff is minor? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. the, five, the five solas are really integral and uh, important to, to understand. I'm really, I'm, I'm absolutely 100% supporting the Reformation on the five solas. Of course, the other thing that comes out of the Reformation is Calvinism. Yeah. Uh, really, there's nothing I hate more than Calvinism. I want to say that's a Jesuit invention just so I sleep better. <laughs> <laughs> it's counter-reformation. Yeah. The five <laughs> solas, in case someone watching doesn't know what we mean, is the sola is Latin. S-O-L-A. It means only. So, uh, sola gracia. Only grace. Only because God is gracious can we be saved. Not because of any merit by us. Uh, sola fide. Only because of faith. Not because of any work that we do, but only because we have faith. Sola Cristo. Only because of Jesus. In other words, it's not only only faith, but the faith must only be in Christ, not ourselves, not in our ability to contribute to our salvation. And then sola uh, gloria means only glory for God. Only if we have these other tenets can, does God get all the glory. We cannot claim any glory. If we think that we are contributing to our salvation, we're in a position to do what Paul warned. He said, lest any man should boast. No boasting, all glory for Jesus. And then finally, sola scriptura, only scriptures. We don't get our doctrines from anybody in a, any pastor, anybody on YouTube, uh, any famous uh, theologian of the past, any church fathers, only from scripture. Only what the Bible says is the test for all of our, our, our conclusions about uh, the, um, God and, and, and the faith. So those are the five solas, and if you get that right, you're in good shape. Very good shape. Um, is there any questions from the chat room that you would like to ask Brother Luke? Well, we've talked a long time, and they're probably mm -hmm. real tired of listening to me by now. Uh, so... Yeah, uh, I'll talk as long as anybody's interested, but uh, we, we uh, yeah, unless there's something more that, well, I don't want to, I'm not trying to cut you off. So we'll, we'll, Favorite Bible verses. My favorite Bible verses. Yes, sir. Uh, I guess it, it's it's all, well, my favorite Bible verses mostly are about the, the identity of Jesus and the means of salvation. So, yeah. Um, when, when we see that uh, in, in, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, the word was God and the word was manifest in the flesh, uh, flesh and uh, then uh, he was manifest in the flesh. That, that, those verses who tell, and the verses in the beginning of, of the first chapter of Hebrews uh, tell me about who Jesus is. And then the means of salvation, uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 and, and all the verses that Paul wrote that refuting works uh, by uh, um, we're, we're, uh, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. People say, well, where in the Bible does it say we're saved by faith alone? James says the word alone. James refutes it. James says that so a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Faith alone. So they say, well, see, that's what James says. What does it, where in the Bible does it say you are saved by faith alone? And I say, well, Paul says, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. That means faith without the law, being that means faith alone. And I say, I can also give you 300 more verses that say that we're saved by believing or by faith, and there is no mention of anything else. So those verses are saying we're saved by believing or by faith and nothing else is mentioned. Therefore, the verse is teaching faith alone. Otherwise, it would have had to include it in the verse. 
So uh, those are the verses that I find that to be that I love the most that uh, that give us this blessed assurance. But then you've got wonderful verses all throughout the Bible on every kind of thing, all over Proverbs. I love the wise say, sayings in Proverbs. Proverbs is beautiful. For anybody who hasn't studied it, it may seem hard at first, but they repeat a lot. And if you just spend time in the book, it's going to say it a different way for you. And you will come out much wiser than you went in. Um, it's especially good for the young. All right, Brother Luke, why did you lose your goatee? Why did I lose my goatee? Yes. Uh, well, I've had goatees and various shapes of beards uh, off and on for many years. I just get a little bit tired of a particular thing and want to change sometimes. And also, uh, sometimes it's because of the urging of my wife. And my, my wife says, <laughs> Uh, you know, your beard's pretty gray. It's making, makes you look older. I say, okay, I don't need it. I'll cut it off because she likes it this particular way. I'll wear my hair a certain way or cut my beard or not beard a certain way. Usually if my wife asks me to, <laughs> I found out that there, remember that Bible verse that says a happy wife is a happy life. Isn't that uh, in the Bible? I don't think that's a Bible verse, but yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's better than living on the corner of the roof. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true, and you find that in Proverbs. Yeah, you're, uh, you'd rather be a man uh, living in a attic or off in the middle of the, the wilderness than, than in a house with a, a nagging wife. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, give me one second. Some people at that. Hendrix. How has your relationship with your family and friends been affected since you believe the gospel? Um, well, um, as I said, uh, initially it was a disaster. Uh, my wife, my marriage broke up temporarily over it. Uh, and, uh, I encountered people that reacted to me as some kind of a cult member of Jesus freak was the term that was being used back then. And, uh, the, the but then eventually they got used to it, my family and friends. And eventually some of them came to believe. I've had several friends and family members that came to believe and they're passionate for Jesus. And, uh, and uh, as I said, sometimes a person's initial reaction is, oh God, not, not that, come on. You, you're not, you didn't fall for that, dude. That's ridiculous, Luke. I mean, well, don't you know anything about science? And, uh, and, and then 20 years later, they say they they know my life and they've watched me and they saw that my faith has grown and grown and and my my really my uh, ministry works have, have gone on and they've witnessed it and they've they said and when they do have a question they start seeking they say Luke's the guy I need to go to Luke will know they come to me then very good um, if you had a friend who isn't a believer. And she, so it's female, feels like her life is a mess. How would you give her the good message and comfort her at the same time? Hmm. You kind of got to know some personal stuff there. Well, no, nothing really changes from one scenario to the next. True. Uh, I, I would tell the person, look, uh, I know how unhappy you are, but... Bible says life is like a vapor. It appears for a short time and then disappears. Maybe we have 70 years. The Bible says we have 70 years on the average. Sometimes it's cut short in, in, in people that are taken suddenly with no warning. So you don't know how long you're going to be here. And while you're here, maybe you'll be have wonderful lives or maybe you have a difficult life. But what really matters is after we die, because that's eternity. Do you want to have an eternity full of joy and bliss and happiness and ecstasy? This is what Jesus promises to us. Is, is that of interest to you? And, and, and by the way, if you want that and you receive that, the Holy Spirit of God lives in you and will comfort you. I think that kind of approach is what I would have to take with that person. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I have read in passing, but you lived it, so you can give me a little bit 
better idea that during the hippie movement, it started with the Jesus movement too, and that there were several cults, but several truth um, groups too. Is that true? Well, you remember that, uh, that play, that musical play, Jesus Christ Superstar? A little bit, yes. Okay, well, well, when that came out, probably around 1970, 72, something like that period, uh, and everybody's growing their hair and smoking pot and taking LSD and stuff. And then that and that play came out. A lot of people did uh, probably get interested in Jesus at that time, and, and because it was more like being a hippie, they think they thought of Jesus as being kind of like a hippie. Uh, that's how they pictured him. And uh, and but the problem with that play, and they have it also available in a movie is that they're presenting Jesus as not God because the people who wrote it and produced it were Jewish people. So they, mm -hmm. they didn't present Jesus as God really in it. They presented him as uh, just a man. Mary mm -hmm. Magdalene sings a song, he's a man, just a man. And uh, so even though uh, people would get interested in Jesus and want to have a hippie Jesus type of lifestyle, uh, uh, and, you know, Foxes have holes and stuff, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. You know, they, 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 a lot of people were embracing that kind of attitude. Just they want a complete freedom, no job, no responsibility, just live in the outdoors and stuff. And, and uh, so they thought they were being like Jesus, but they also thought of Jesus as just being a, a great moral teacher, a prophet maybe, but they didn't think of him as God. Um, have you ever heard of the Rainbow People? The what? The rainbow people? No, the only term rainbow I'm familiar with is the uh, the like a political coalition of a like collection of various groups of people, um, e ethnic groups and groups are coming together to uniting politically. Uh, Jesse right. Jackson, I think, formed a thing called the Rainbow Coalition, but uh, I don't know if that's the same thing you're referring to. No, um, these are people who camp in the tents in the national parks and stuff, and they seem to be leftovers of the hippie movement that believe in Jesus. And I just wonder if they have that hippie Jesus or if they have the real one. But anyway, yeah. Uh, um, They're out of questions. Um, me and you can go all night if you'd like to. Is there anything we didn't cover that you would like to discuss? Well, I, I probably think of something later or tomorrow that I, I thought, oh, I wish I had said that. But uh, but we've been pretty darn thorough. Uh, I guess the only thing I would say is that uh, what I'd like to do from this point forward and, and my hope uh, is that... Uh, um, one of the things I like about YouTube, uh, and I don't know if, it, if I can uh, have confidence that everything on YouTube is going to be up 10, 20 years from now. Maybe it'll all fall apart and, and they'll get rid of certain channels and stuff. I don't know how long that's going to last, but I, I'm hopeful that my YouTube channel will be a legacy. I really believe that of everything I've ever done in my life, and I've done, I've done um, some things that I could boast, I've made some accomplishments. I've won a lot of awards in various th endeavors I've done. But the only thing that really matters besides my wife and son, those relationships, is the um, uh, that I, I feel that has really some value is the, the videos and playlists I have here as a resource for people. And the Church of the Eternally Secure that offers everybody this opportunity to have a congregation under this these guidelines. We have three dogmas, and don't bring a fourth dogma in here. You insist that we agree with you on another fourth one, then then you don't belong here because you're intolerant. You, we, we don't any don't, no more dogmas besides the three. And so uh, that I believe is a great contribution, and I'm hoping that it it uh, it lasts. You're looking for um, maximum liberty, it sounds like. Yeah. Um, have you had any traumatic or near-death experiences? Yeah, yeah, that's funny. Uh, I can say it's funny, but... Uh, uh, 
I was uh, probably about 10 years ago. Uh, I, I got uh, quite ill and, and I was sitting at home in my recliner and I, I went to stand up and I, I, I got up just a little bit and fell back on the chair and I had no strength. And my wife was just in the other room, only a, a wall and a door separated us. And yet I could not raise my voice loud enough to get her attention. I was so weak, I could not lift up my arms and I could not raise my voice to get her attention. But I had the, the portable phone right next to me. So I was able to dial 911 and we got an ambulance came over and they said, should we kick down the door? And they were banging on the door. And that got my wife's attention. So they, they got in and they put me in the ambulance and took me to the hospital. And But they said that my heart stopped completely uh, twice on the ride to the hospital. And I, I was unaware of that. But but when I'm in the emergency room, I, I actually, um, I, I had this feeling of such weakness and I became, my body was uh, going through a tremor of shaking from, it felt like I was freezing and I had no energy. I couldn't even lift a finger. I could barely breathe. I was too weak to take a breath. And I, I assumed that I was dying. I just thought I'm dying. I, ca I can't even have the strength to take a breath. And of course I didn't die, but uh, that's, that's, I guess uh, that's the, the only time I think that uh, I was very, very close to dying, I was I thought I was dying. But apart from that, no, um, uh, I've had quite a few surgeries. I had brain surgery and three back surgeries and open heart surgery. And of course, during that time, during the heart, you have your heart out and they have to stop your heart while they're doing this surgery for hours. And uh, it's uh, so technically, I think you're dead without your heart being. Uh, in a way, but uh, I'm sure they were circulating blood through me, so I wouldn't be, you know, brain dead. But uh, so, but I didn't. Uh, I I don't claim to have any kind of out of body experience like 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 we've heard about. And I, I think some of these experiences may be true. I don't know. Some of them seem pretty convincing. That a person says that they're hovering above their body and they go throughout the hospital and they observe things that, in other rooms that they, they it's impossible for them to know about and they get all these facts straight so some of it is hard to argue against right. well god is powerful we know that he can do what he wants right. um i'm gonna echo a sentiment um we are so thankful to jesus that you're here with us brother luke you are a blessing to all of us you really are your depth of knowledge is just wonderful. Though you're sometimes short on patience, you say. Yes, yes. We really appreciate yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I I think you know I used to pray for patience, but I stopped praying for it because I'm afraid to get what it will cost me to get it. <laughs> you know, to get to learn patience, you have to be go through trials to develop your patience. And I don't, I don't want that. So I'd rather be impatient and not have to go, go through the difficult period of learning patience. Absolutely. Um, just ask Alex, somebody, if you think you want patience. <laughs> ask yeah. him how, how God works that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, so I guess that's a thank you very much. That was very nice of you to say. And uh, I... Uh, I, I guess we've, we've you've been very thorough. This has probably gone on longer than... Uh, any video, any interview we've done, we usually do 90 it's minutes. It's appropriate. Thank you, two hours. <laughs> okay. Uh, hey, uh, I'd like to compliment you. Uh, I know you, you you took the kind of the format that I've been using and trying to learn about me from birth into present time and looking into the future and, and that to and get to know all the intimate details. And uh, I enjoy learning all these things about everybody. And uh, now you know all these things. You even know my secret real identity and mm -hmm. all things and some things that, uh, you know, some people would be embarrassed to tell you the things I've said. But I'm not embarrassed because I, uh, I know that, uh, you know, uh, I'm uh, absolutely, uh, as the Bible says, uh, the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And the things I've done in my life qualify. As I said, I feel I was a professional liar for 17 years. That's all I did was lie for a living. 
And then there are all kinds of criminal activities I did that my friends are in prison now or dead. And I was, I was Jesus, somehow I, I was spared that. So, um, yeah, you know a lot of things, and but I'm not uh, embarrassed by any of it. I would be, but if I didn't know that uh, Jesus loves me, and uh, so I don't need to be embarrassed. Um, we did forget to ask your social security number and your bank routing number. Yeah, my bank. Uh, well, I can't give you that, but you want my bank <laughs> number? My bank pin number? No, your routing number. Oh. <laughs> 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 Okay, uh, I'm going to have to look it up and then I'll post it in the chat room later, okay? Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm out of questions. If there's anything you'd like to say and then you can do your classic sign off. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, all I'm going to say now is that uh, the reason I'm being interviewed tonight by Brother Mark, thankfully, I appreciate you recognizing there was a void and I guess the only way to fill the void was to either flip the script and I'm the one that gets interviewed because we didn't have anybody on the agenda to be interviewed. So I'm going to ask again, anybody in the congregation, if you're somebody who's been with us for a little while and you're, you consider yourself a member of the congregation and you do believe correctly, the core doctrines and, uh, um, I would love to interview you and the same process that you saw me go through tonight. We'd, we'd like to get to know you by learning about your life. Uh, we have about 15 or 16 others in the congregation that have gone through this before you. So uh, next Friday, unless we have someone contact me and say, uh, uh, Luca, I'll be next. Uh, then uh, I'll, we'll be uh, up the creek without a paddle again without anybody to interview. So please. Uh, consider it and if you're shy pray about it god will strengthen you you, you know you'll be able to do it it's, it's you know if there's some things you don't want to talk about tell me uh, i'm not going to push you to talk about anything you're not comfortable with okay uh so brother uh that's that's the last thought i have uh, except uh don't forget to join us on sunday 5 p.m eastern for the church of the eternally secure and don't forget wednesday night 6 30 p.m eastern I'm Pacific. We do the Wednesday night Bible study, and we're uh, we're we're in Romans chapter nine, uh, showing you how Calvinism is is the wrong way to understand chapter nine. You don't want to look at it through a Calvinistic lens at all. Okay, all right, brother. Um, thank you. All right, so I guess I'll say good night to everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, for listening, and I'll go scroll through the. Uh, the chat room uh, probably tomorrow carefully and look at the comments and questions, see if there's anything I need to respond to. But uh, Brother Mark, uh, it was very enjoyable. It's always a, a joy just to talk to you anyway, but thank you. Oh, uh, the, you didn't, the you pleasure didn't excellent mine. Excellent And I've job. had a great privilege. Thank you. I feel honored. <laughs> thank you, brother. Okay, so good night, everybody, and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus. <laughs>